It's my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Jeff Halberts, who is a professor in psychological and brain science at Indiana University, and he, he has crossed the ocean once again to speak because he has spoken uh, several times here. And uh, he has done a tremendous research work on the development of sociality in animal rodents and especially in the sensory mechanisms involved in uh, parents' and offspring interactions. And um, today <coughs> he is not all, only a scientist, he's also an ITCA professional working uh, at Cincinnati hospitals. And so it will be very stimulating for us to hear you talk uh, about uh, co-evolution of lactation and suckling that illuminates the adaptive challenges of prematurely born infants. So Jeff, please. Thank you, Pierre. So I'm not exactly sure how to uh, make this transition from that extraordinary talk of, that Sophia shared with us. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with thanking uh, Sophia and, and quickly go on to thank um, Bjorn uh, for initiating me into this, this wonderful society of, of uh, ultra-early intervention meetings. It's always wonderful to be with you and uh, welcoming Stina to your new leadership role. And uh, thank you very much for including me. It's a uh, it's, it's already a wonderful experience for me to to, uh, to get this talk assembled because it's something uh, new and, and has turned out to be quite meaningful to me. And if I can do anything um, this morning, what I'd like to do is um, earnestly attempt to change forever uh, the way that you will look at uh, a nursing mother and her infant. Um, I hope that what I can do in, in this, this too short time that I have is... Um, to give you a, a sense of um, how one can learn to look at, at that, that picture or that, that phenomenon of the, the nursing mom and, and her infant and see it um, for what you know it is in terms of its biology and its psychology, but also to see it through uh, what I'll refer to as deep time. And um, this is what I mean is that, that I think we can all benefit both um, um, emotionally and, and scientifically from appreciating the ancient, her ancient heritage that's, that's uh, contained in these relationships. Um, and I hope that by the end of the presentation, um, you'll see the significance of this, um, this perspective. So these, um, I hope you can see these, these, um, this sample of photographs um, that I have, but these are all what? These are all mammals, uh, in including, of course, the, the human mother in her infant in here. But not, and what I want to do in, in this presentation is put um, our biology and, and our experiences in the, the context of what I, I sometimes refer, refer to as the mammalian experience. And it's our experience. Um, so um, we'll talk a little bit about um, um, what mammals are. But as, as you know already, and as I'll point out in a moment, just by the very name of mammals and mammary glands, um, we are a class of animals, but today about 5,400, 5,500 different species of mammals, but we all share lots of things in common, and lactation is, is one of them. Um, so that, but regardless, these are mammals that live underwater, mammals that live in trees, mammals that fly, mammals that live underground, mammals that live on the ground, and we are all, again, unified by um, these experiences. By the way, we'll, we'll touch on um, th some of these um, really remarkable characters. That's a, um, a duck-billed platypus. It's a, a, a mammal that lays eggs and is without nipples and is a very, very important part of the, the evolutionary story that, um, that I want to tell. Um, I also have to say that um, it's a really a, a remarkable source of um, of pleasure and excitement for me to, to, to make this first presentation of this material here um, because this, this gentleman, Carl Linnaeus, who's the, um, the individual who named mammals and who is the, the, the greatest classifier of, uh, of life on Earth uh, and arranged all the, the phylogeny, um, did his work here in Sweden. And it was 260 years ago this year that he named mammals. And so, Again, but, but a treat <laughs> to, to be able to talk about this um, in, in Sweden uh, and at, at this time. This is when Linnaeus introduced the class of organisms, the mammalia. Um, 
So we're, um, we mammals are quite an extraordinary class. Um, the name alone is, is, was unique because Linnaeus never named a group of animals um, with a, a term that didn't apply to all of the individuals in the group. But for human beings, he made, or I'm sorry, for mammals, he made this exception. Mammals are named on the base of mammary glands that are shown by about half the members of the species. He, this is, actually, this is a whole different story, and I, I, I won't go there today, but he was, um, as, a, as a, a physician and father of seven children, um, actively engaged in the uh, anti-wet nursing movement of, of his era, and he was quite focused on, on the uh, significance of, of maternal nursing of, of their own children, and this is presumed to be a major source of his decision to, to use this, this name. It, it was a, a remarkable and uh, revolutionary idea at the time to, um, to go across all of these species, and it's, it's held up extraordinarily well because people thought that they really should be organized around tetrapods and other anatomical features, not mammary glands. But this classification is held up extremely well. Um, some of the defining characteristics of mammals is, are the, the three ear bones, homeothermy, it's not unique, but it is part of mammalian having fur, very important is glandular skin in terms of the, the evolution of mammals, and of course lactation, and everything that comes with it, and we already had a, a very poignant um, introduction to many of the, the hidden and uh, still profound dimensions of, of what's involved in lactation and, and holding our babies and, and nursing them. Um, lactation implies a specialized anatomy, specialized endocrine components, immature young, uh, but our specialized young, and of course maternal behavior, and all that comes with that, with bonding and sociality. Um, what's almost as, as amazing to me as, uh, as the actual phenomena of lactation uh, and suckling and the exquisite coordination that, we're, that I think most of you are aware of, a coordination between lactation and suckling, between the lactating mother and her developing suckling infant. What's as amazing as that th those phenomena is how rare it is that we actually ask questions about how this all came about. I don't know why we aren't always wandering the halls of the hospitals and, and our streets, just amazed and asking each other, how did this happen? Uh, but we don't. Darwin did ask a little bit. There have been, uh, it's another story again, the, the history of the, the, the uh, questions of the evolution of lactation, but it's actually a, a very sparse story. Um, but it is amazing. And, and once we've started asking, um, I think the, the answers have been quite astonishing. So I'll, I'll begin this, um, this very, very brief review with um, homage to um, this gentleman, Olaf Oftedal who's um, a, a scientist at the Smithsonian Institution in the States. And um, he's spent his, his life um, as a, a biochemist and nutritionalist doing, running all over the world, um, collecting milk from different mammals and analyzing them. And somewhere along the way became this extraordinary scholar uh, on the evolution of lactation. But uh, from the first time I sat down and spoke with him, I started to feel, and I think he agreed, that this was really only part of the story, and the story really is the relationship between lactation and mammary glands and suckling offspring, and this is where my construct of a, of a co-evolutionary story came from. Olaf is, um, is, is quite prolific with some remarkably profound papers, and the, the two that are um, I've listed on this slide are the two that, um, when I came across them, um, sort of changed my, my intellectual life in, in, in that phase. Um, and uh, I can only give you a very, very brief rendition of what he's saying in these papers, but let me start on that. So according to Olaf Oftedal, the, um, this is the evolution of lactation, a part of the story. Major message is that lactation evolved before there were mammals. Lactation evolved before mammals evolved. Um, and his argument is, and it's beautifully, beautifully constructed, is that functionally the early secretions of pre-mammalian mothers was to hydrate eggs. So these are pre-mammalian species. There are no mammals on Earth. The tetrapods that are, have left the water have started to, to take steps on land, sometimes in water, sometimes on land, uh, are still 
oviparous. They're still egg-laying animals. They don't lay eggs um, of the sort that, that you and I, I, I would think of as eggs, these, these hard-shelled avian eggs. Those are actually not ancestral eggs. Those are derived eggs, the hard-shelled calcium um, egg case. The, uh, the primordial eggs, which still exist in, in some reptiles and in the monotremes, the, the egg-laying mammals, are soft-shelled parchment-like, parchment-shelled eggs um, that um, evolved, uh, as they evolved, they evolved in, in many lines, especially the premammalian lines, to get <coughs> smaller and smaller with less and less yolk um, as, as part of the evolution of homeothermy and leaving the water and starting to ex exploit um, other areas of, of the, of the uh, environment. Um, and this is going to be, I'm going to say this again, but this is a hard story to tell quickly because it's not a linear story, the story of evolution. It's a story where lots of things are evolving in bodies all at the same time. Um, but eventually, these eggs <coughs> are going to um, be retained uh, inside the mother's bodies, and what is going to evolve is live birth. But I'm jumping ahead by millions of years um, when I say that. But, uh, but egg laying has evolved into vipery, ovipery, into viviparous life, live births. It has evolved independently at least a hundred times in different species on Earth. It has never evolved in the reverse. And that's just a, a little factoid to, to keep in mind as we're, we're talking about these, these overall patterns. So at any rate, Oftedal has um, assembled a lot of data to argue convincingly that the glandular skin of, of the animals that became mammals uh, was um, actively secreting fluids, water initially, um, to keep these eggs hydrated because these parchment shelled eggs are are um, uh, subject to desiccation. And um, if the animals are going to take them onto land, they're going to have to protect them, and they do this by secreting some fluids. And this, these fluids eventually will evolve into milk, and that's a separate wonderful story on the evolution of milk itself. So let me just show you this the part of the phylogenetic tree that um, that Oftedal uses um, to, to talk about this particular journey. And this one begins actually relatively recently in, in terms of evolutionary time. We're going back about 310 million years. And the big event that, that uh, frames the Oftedal's analysis is the evolution of the amniote egg. Um, and so there's a group of animals called the amniotes, and they are right here at Roman numeral one about 310 million years ago. And there's among these amniotes, there's a huge divergence. There's a group of, of animals that have scaly skin, and they go off in this direction, and they become the turtles, the crocodiles, the dinosaurs, the birds, all the squamates. And because of the scaly skin that it can eventually evolve into feathers, they never have a chance to even think about lactation. They do other things. They have crop milk. They, they have other kinds of parental behavior, and other kinds of of homeothermy, but the seropsid line is completely separate. This is very confusing to some people who are um, enamored with the, the triune brain um, and the reptilian brain that, that's sometimes used metaphorically because, in fact, mammals did not evolve from reptiles. Uh, the, this, is a, this is an important divergence and it's an important correction to a lot of, of um, our language in, in evolution. Uh, we, we have a, car, a, a common ancestor in the amniote group for sure, but um, we did not evolve from reptiles. And, and in English, at least, there's this unfortunate term of um, reptile-like mammals, which refer to the, the therapsids, and, and that, again, is, has reinforced this, this misconception. But at any rate, at this point of the amniotes, these, um, these scaly-skinned animals went in this direction, became the seropsids, and then there was a group of glandular skin uh, amniotes that go into this line that become the synapsids defined by uh, a single window in the side of the skull called the fenestra or a single fenestra uh, that defines these, these synapsids and the seropsids don't have that. They have a dual uh, fenestra or none at all in this group. But this, this single windowed group, the synapsids, go through this line and um, lactation is actually going to, I'm getting way ahead, but lactation is going to start appearing in these groups around this time, in the Permian and early Triassic. And it's going to be not until here that mammal-like organisms are, are appearing and lactation is already in place. 
and these are still the, these egg-laying animals. So the early tetrapods live close to water. They laid their eggs in the water or in very wet environments. Their, their movements and their survival were constrained by gas exchange and water loss from these eggs. Um, and the amniote egg, by definition, had an extra embryonic membrane that functioned to, um, to facilitate gas exchange and water retention. Uh, these amniotes that are appearing at, the, at this stage, about 300 million years ago, are small um, lizard-like animals in the sense of how their bones were structured, and they, they use the, the gait of the lizards, and it wasn't as, as they're transforming, their shoulders and hips are now coming under a spine that's starting to arch more, and they're beginning to, to take steps and move faster, both to get away as prey or to move faster as predators on land, and the race has begun for, for um, living the life um, on Earth. Um, and the amniote eggs, then, um, were the invention, thinking now re more reproductively, that forecast the placenta and the amniotic sac. This is the, the beginning, the beginning, the beginning of us. So, um, again, this, this is where I wanted to, to say again that it's difficult to tell this story quickly and coherently because stories are best told in a nice linear tale, and this is not a linear story, I'm afraid to say. Um, so I'm, I'm giving it my best shot, but I just have to point out that what I'm telling a story about is how a multitude of separable elements that are each being selected for, um, for very important parts of their life, and each are inter interacting with others in the same bodies during evolution. All of this is going on at the same time. And what I've listed here is just a sampling of these, these elements that um, have been analyzed in, in beautiful detail by paleontologists and paleobiologists and summarized and integrated, for me, um, in these, these initial writings of Oftedal, where he discusses all of these different kinds of traits and, and their interactions. I'll talk about just a very few. So we've talked about the amniote eggs, we've talked a little bit about the terrestrial niche and ovip, uh, ovipary. Uh, I've referred to the, this trend towards smaller size and smaller yolks. This, by the way, is in the face of dinosaurs and other creatures that are, are taking over the earth and, and the animals that I'm talking about, these premammalian forms, are small, timid, shy, nocturnal uh, organisms that are found in their fossil lives, tucked away in little um, um, stumps of, of wet trees uh, and be beautifully preserved. They're furred. Uh, they're, there's lots of evidence that they were endothermic. There's some evidence that they were p parental. Um, they, and I'll touch on some of these other elements in just a moment. Um, well, they're parental, and um, they have a reduced number of ribs. I'm going to be talking a lot about endothermy and the things that support um, uh, dietary specializations that, that bring in enough energy that you can generate body heat. And, and run fast and be hunters and run away from things. I've mentioned uh, ovipary and viviparity. I haven't mentioned these epipubic bones. And these are, um, this is a, a, a skeleton um, sort of randomly selected of a, of a platypus. And these here, these protuberances are the epipubic bones. The epipubic bones appear in all of these early premammalian forms. They're these protuberances that come forward from the, 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 um, the pelvis. And um, there's some analyses that are biomechanical that, that analyze how they probably were uh, facilitated uh, early locomotion. But they're also structures in such a way that the skin that would overlie them would form a, a not a pouch, but a, a shelf and a, con a beginning of a container that could hold eggs and hold them close to the body. And that, in fact, in, in the modern monotremes is part of what they do already. Um, so these epipubic bones are still present in, in the monotremes and, um, and are used to support the young, and they're, they're found in a wide, wide range of the earlier forms. Um, so this is, these are, are all part of, of features that we, we refer to in biology as conserved, biologically conserved features. Another one that I find wonderfully fascinating that, that becomes relevant to the feeding <laughs> issues is the, um, the evolution of the, the secondary hard palate. And this is part of this whole suite of characteristics, the reduction in numbers of ribs that allows diaphragmatic breathing and allows more oxygen for more energy for faster running, the, the whole, all the, the features that, that come with endothermy, and the ability to have nasal respiration uh, separate from the mouth. 
when you have things in the mouth. So, for example, um, here's a, a, a semi-random photograph of a of a marten with its prey, and without the hard palate, you could not c carry and eat your prey and breathe. So it's a, a beautiful um, specialization for for being a, a good predator, and a, a, but it's also it turns out to be a necessary pre-adaptation for suckling. And without the the kind of jaw that the the synapsids had evolved, without the cheeky, the, the fleshy cheeks, without the secondary hard palate, without the evolution of this kind of endothermy, there could be no suckling. That's why I find it a, a wonderful um, kind of a kind of irony that it's our ability to to have suckling young is actually based on the early evolution of predation. Um, and and also really is is linked primarily to uh, to respiratory adaptations. So. Very, very important one. Um, I won't spend much more time on um, on the uh, the parchment shelled eggs, but I just want to point out that that one of the two papers that I had uh, featured of of Oftedals when I showed that first slide was a paper, a long paper, completely dedicated to analyzing the um, the the physics of parchment shelled eggs. That is their size, their ability to their 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 tendency to desiccation, their ability to be rehydrated, um, the, the, basically the biophysics of these eggs is, an, is another one of his extraordinary papers. Um, but as, as this slide says, that the early eggs were not calcified, and uh, the hard shells of, of bird eggs are derived traits, not, a, not one of primitive amniotes. And the, um, the, the trick with the parchment shelled eggs is to keep them warm so you can be uh, incubating the, the offspring, but by virtue of, of having a temperature gradient like that, they're going to dry out faster. And the solution to that problem was parental behavior. And this came both anatomically, physiologically, and behaviorally to start to evolve the, the phenomenon of, of parental behavior in the, the face of these, these, uh, these kinds of eggs. And, and <coughs> people now refer to the um, the, the combination of this physiology, anatomy, and behavior is creating an incubatorium um, for these parchment shelled eggs and, and protecting them from dehydration. But as they get smaller and, and, and more um, fragile in, in terms of their energetics, they are going to have to, the offspring and the parents, biologically, are going to have to solve the problem of, of successful reproduction another way. Keep in mind now that what we have are. Um, are organisms that are hatching uh, their eggs, and when the, the young come out of the eggs, they do what? They forage and eat. So we've, I'm getting ahead again a little bit in the story, but what we have now is a reproductive, reproductive cycles all over the earth of hatchlings that come out and have a feeding system that's in their brain, in their bodies, in their behavior. They can, they can feed independently. Um, this the story I'm telling, just to remind you about the time courses, we're now up in this range, uh, in the, the late Permian and into the, into the Triassic. And we have these, these animals that are becoming homeothermic, that are still uh, egg-laying, that have evolved these secretions that are protecting these eggs. And these are organisms that look about like this. They're small, about the size of shrews, and in the, for the full range of animals that existed, maybe the, the size of, of small rodents. Uh, this is a, is a modern shrew here. And um, this group um, from these diminutive creatures came all of the 5,500 mammals that we have today from these ancestors of ours. This is where all of the rodents, the dogs, the cats, the giraffes, the rhinos, the whales, the dolphins, uh, the grazing ungulates, the flying bats, all came from, spawned from this, this singular past. What a story. <laughs> uh, and this is, I, I think, this is the story that gives meaning to, to, um, to us. These are the, uh, the more canyon uh, andantids, and they are us, or we are from them. So, as I said at the beginning of the talk, the, um, this evolution of lactation in this, this format um, is only part of the story. 
the other part of the story is the offspring. And I'll go back and forth b between the two. But I want to flip now to the offspring side and uh, discuss something that I've referred to as the dual ingestion system. And it plays off this idea that the, these early organisms, these premammalian forms that are already lactating um, in the sense that they're hydrating their eggs, are producing young that eat. But the young are becoming increasingly immature because there's this evolutionary pressure for small size, small yolks, and therefore immaturity at the same time. So they come into the external world equipped with uh, a heritage of the ability to feed, but they're small and vulnerable. But they're also born into a world where their substrate is the maternal body, this nice moist environment, and they can start to exploit that as well. So why do I say dual ingestion system here, um, rather than, um, than a, a, a simple primitive ingestion system, system that develops gradually into a more sophisticated form of independent ingestion? Because when I started to think about this and talk to people about it, especially when I was in hospital environments, almost without exception, every individual that I spoke to who works with, with early feeding tends to view what they're doing when they're working, especially with preemies, as being in a place where they're, they're working with a primitive, reflex-dominated, dominated, very, very simple form of ingestion that will, with patience and support and, and expert care, become feeding. Uh, and I want to argue that this is not really the case, that what you're doing is you're working with a specialized form of ingestion. So what I really want to do is talk about the development of ingestion, and I'm going to talk about it as the development of two separable systems. A feeding system which evolutionarily existed, and a suckling system which came into existence under these peculiar circumstances of hydrating eggs, but became something else entirely. And is, of course, extraordinarily important. And this is the dual ingestion system. So again, after hatching, the early premammalian synapsids could feed. Um, they were increasingly immature over evolutionary time, and they found themselves in this wet glandular environment. They drank, and they gradually um, exploited resources. I don't know if we'll have time today to talk about the, my notion about these actual evolutionary steps were, but I think they're testable today, um, and I think we can demonstrate what some of them are. But what I want to talk about now is the basis of a new ingestion system that comes with viviparity, and that is the one that we see in suckling infants. But keep in mind, that with this analysis, that suckling evolved after feeding evolved. So feeding had evolved already, and now we are evolving a separate suckling system. In many cases, the, the way most uh, evo-devo, developmental evolutionary biologists, evolutionary developmental biologists think is they'd like to think that the most common way that you evolve new traits is that you put them on the end. You, you have a, a, de a developmental cycle, and what you do is you add something else to the, the terminal. But now we're doing something very different. We're inserting something early in development that's novel. This is, a, is what's called, in the language of, of, of this kind of science, is, is a pedomorphic um, a strategy. So this new behavior is inserted, uh, not at the end of developmental sequence, but it's inserted pedomorphically in a separate earlier stage of ontogeny. And in this new earlier position, suckling evolves into a distinct behavior. It's independently organized, and it's separable from the existing feeding system. Easy to say. Now what I want to do is just give you a lightning review of some of the evidence for why I think this is true. So I'm going to go into my, my sort of workaday field of developmental psychobiology and share with you snippets of, of our, our science and the literature. So here's a sampling of, uh, of the evidence for these, these somewhat heretical ideas. First I'll talk about, very briefly, the sensory and motor aspects of suckling versus feeding. So I'm taking ingestion, I'm dividing it into two kinds of ingestion. I'll refer to feeding as independent feeding, suckling as, as suckling. So in this world of the dual ingestion, we can look at the sensory controls. If we make a young rat or a mouse anosmic, we deprive it of its sense of smell, you can completely eliminate ingestion. You do this to a weanling animal or to an adult, and you can change feeding a little bit, but the system works just fine. Sensory basis, though, is, is clearly separable. People have done very, very exacting electromyographic analyses of suckling and feeding, and they can look at muscle group by muscle group in the overall patterning. Suckling is a unique pattern. 
as feeding comes in, suckling can continue, but as feeding comes in, you see some of the muscle, same muscles being used, but they use differently, and you see unique EMG patterns coming in solely for feeding. So in that regard, they're separable. Then there are a host of, of uh, hormones and peptides and, and chemicals, which turn uh, these days the zeitgeist, because they're always the promises for the next best diet pill or the next best thing that, that's going to control feeding. We really don't know how feeding is regulated and how hunger is related. Sophia, um, in, uh, toward the end of her talk, made these remarkable observations of children who grow up not knowing hunger. When in all of the textbooks of motivation and drives, hunger is this immutable uh, aspect of, of life. But preemies are telling us that this is not necessarily true, that there's lots of plasticity. And, and development to be understood. At any rate, there are these, these, these hormones. Insulin, that in some ways, controls food intake. Um, leptin, cholecystokinin, and ghrelin. And if you go through each of these, these substances, what you find is that, that the, the suckling animal responds differentially to them. So insulin will increase feeding, but it does not affect suckling. Leptin, which decreases feeding, doesn't change suckling. Cholecystokinin doesn't affect suckling, but it does collect feeding, affect feeding. Garolin, um, a stomach secretion, same story, decreases feeding, but doesn't affect suckling. The, the young, the very young animal uh, in our experiments is really a suckling machine. It doesn't respond to gut fill. It doesn't respond to all of the, the normal kinds of cues. It has its own rules and its own mechanisms. Um, Pharmacologically, it's different. If you give amphetamine to an adult animal, and by the way, most of these things I'm telling about, these I'm obviously not going through experiment by experiment. In many ways, these are not perfect experiments, the ones that are, are um, holding up the data that I was showing. That's, again, another story of controlling for milk availability and maternal behavior and all their, those interactions. But the basic pattern holds up extraordinarily well. Um, and also what shows up very nicely is that sometimes these experiments are done in weanling animals that are at stages in their life where they're both feeding and suckling. And you can have in the same animal effects that are shown on their feeding system but not on their suckling system at the same, the same days or within, within two days of experiments. We give amphetamine to uh, adult organisms. It's an anorectic. They feed less. We give amphetamine to a suckling animal. They suckle more. It activates their behavior is really what it's doing, and what, and these are these little suckling machines, so they, they actually suckle more. You can block serotonin in weanling animals, and you can actually reinstate suckling. These are animals that have just matured to the point where they're 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 not approaching the mother, they're not attaching to nipples. You give a serotonergic blocker, and you can reinstate the behavior. What you're doing is reopening a system that's there. It has not become feeding. It has been inhibited, and you can disinhibit it. Uh, more evidence that suckling is not feeding. Uh, as I mentioned, I think very briefly, if you give a caloric preload, put some, some calories in the, the suckling animal's stomach, um, or into the animal's stomach, if, if you then test the animal for feeding, it will eat less. Suckling animals doesn't affect them at all. But if you preload them with water, the suckling animal, it will suckle less. Uh, if you manipulate another kind of aspect of thirst, if you give them an osmotic challenge, it doesn't affect them. But if you give a volemic challenge, remember there are two kinds of thirst. We have osmotic thirst and volemic thirst. And it looks like suckling is immune to osmotic thirst cues, but is sensitive to, to volemic thirst cues. And indeed, this is what the organism is most susceptible to, is, is to become hypovolemic. So uh, hypovolemic thirst does increase suckling. Osmotic thirst does not. Uh, some work from, um, continuing with this, these, uh, the separation of suckling and feeding, some earlier work from my lab is, um, I can't go through these experiments again in, in detail, but um, <coughs> what we basically showed is that when an animal is, is engaged in suckling from its mother and you make it experimentally ill with lithium chloride, for example, to the taste, it does not learn the aversion. The same animal, a litter mate, um, sitting next to the mother, 
having exactly the same taste experiences because we're pumping these tastes directly into its mouth, um, Maydell does learn the aversion. But suckling prevents the animal from forming negative associations. It's, again, a different kind of dissociation be between the two. I've encountered physicians in, in the uh, NICUs in, in the States who will um, mindfully separate mothers from their infants uh, in anticipation of painful procedures because from their Psychology 101 class, they remembered things about as associative learning, and they don't want to associate the mother with, a, with an aversive experience. I'm telling you, the, the association of the, of the babies and their mothers protects the infants from aversive associations, and separating them actually makes them susceptible to these aversive associations. It's exactly the opposite, and it's a, a part of this, this suckling system. Um, and in another line of work, not from my lab, but from a, a good friend of mine's, uh, he was raising rat pups without any suckling experience in there for the first week, of, which is a big piece of their early life. And then if he then takes out their feeding tubes and gives them uh, access to the mothers, they, they don't suckle. They have not used it and they've, they've lost it. It doesn't affect feeding at all, at least in, in, in rat world, thank you. Um, and finally, very dramatically, from the same uh, laboratory from Ted Hall's lab, um, what he has shown is that he can manipulate these very, very young rats, these, um, these three-day-old rat pups, and under the right circumstances, they're, they're quite extreme circumstances, he can get these obligate sucklers to feed. That is, he, they will eat from puddles of milk or wet mash from the floor, and it's not, it's not suckling ingestion. This is regulated feeding. If he preloads them with calories, they do it less. They eat off the floor enough to get between 5 and 10% of their body weight, and they stop. Um, what he's showing is that in this immature nervous system, there is a feeding system intact. It's not mature, but it is intact enough to be expressed. It's normally never seen. You have to shock the system to, to get them to, to eat off the floor, and they're suckled. So you can both unmask the suckling system, and you can unmask the feeding system. So this, I think, is a profound change in perspective, and I have, I'll wrap this up in, in just these few minutes. Um, it's previously thought, at least by, by me and some others, just logically, that things like skin-to-skin, -skin, pr procedures like skin-to-skin, -skin derive from nursing, that the benefits of skin-to-skin -skin come out because mothers are nursing their infants, and, and therefore we get these, these wonderful uh, effects of, of, of kangaroo care-like stimulation. But I think it's actually the opposite, that nursing and its benefits evolutionarily derive from skin to skin. So it's the, the opposite, not, not to diminish the importance of either one, not to diminish the, the pleasures of feeding and, and what that's become, but in terms of understanding through deep time what, where we come from and what's embedded, that nursing comes from this kind of contact. Contact doesn't come from nursing. So we can see the ancient preeminence of contact, of warmth, and hydration. And we can see in the organization of early nursing behavior that, that this is reflects all of these, these origins. The two systems for ingestion, suckling, and feeding co-reside in every mammal. In each one at different stages of development hides the other. Suckling is not a primitive precursor of feeding. It's a complete, refined form of ingestion that has its own evolutionary origins. And ingestion develops twice in, in this model because it evolved twice. First evolved as feeding, then evolved as, as suckling. So when we work with, with overall ingestive development, we work with, in this dotted line, the onset and expression and dissolution of the suckling system. And we also observe, in a, usually in a coordinated way, the onset and maintenance of, of feeding. And this relationship, this decline, th this is the, the weaning phase, and this is yet another set of, of very important stories. But this, these are not substituting for each other. They're independent um, events. And when we're working with preterms, we're in this very, very special um, phase. So let me just race through these final slides. I have about one minute. I'll just read them to you, because this is um, why I think this is important in the NICU. We have the privilege of often getting to observe the onset of suckling, which you usually don't get to see in, in term babies. They just come out ready to suckle. Um, and to support development, we must understand this phenomenon. 
and it's a privilege to witness a nursing mother and infant to see them through deep time. We're seeing at least 200 million years of formation of, of this of evolutionary change. Uh, the suckling is, is now uh, ingestion. It derived from an ancient process of support, contact, warmth, and hydration. It's a little wonder that newborns are physiologically drinking more than they're eating in, in terms of physiological controls. And we can examine the prenatal origins of suckling. We can appreciate the primacy of breathing and swallowing, which eventually incorporated sucking. And with all of these things came the pleasures derived from contact, warmth, moisture, and nursing. So thank you very much. Yeah.